Marvel Spider-Man, not this one. Sorry. Is a video game that came out in 2018, the same year God of War released and became the fastest selling PlayStation exclusive. Less than five months later, poor Kratos. Sony didn't expect for a Spider-Man game to be a system seller of this magnitude, but as fans of the character, we knew. We knew. But let's face it, popularity does not equate to quality. Spider Media has blown up uncontrollably this past decade. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? No. It's nice to see the brand succeed so well. That said, most of these adaptations offered a boiled down version of Peter Parker, a butchered version that made him out into something he is not, leaving first time audiences with a skewed perception of the character. Even though Spider-Man is at his most popular, he's a far cry from his once golden age of stories that honed in on dramatic storytelling, a life filled with problems, twists, and or turns that highlighted heroic deeds and whimsical adventures in the Big Apple. Insomniac Games, however, the studio with an impressive history that created the likes of Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and Clank, Resistance, and Sunset Overdrive said they'd like to take a stab. Could they possibly craft a game that does the character justice? Yes, the answer is yes. Which is why I welcome you to Hit or Miss, the series where the good, the bad, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, the rise, the falls, and major lifts are all brought to light in the name of a sequel that could improve certain aspects and keep the ones that work. Buckle in, true believers, as we hop into the world of Marvel Spider-Man. No, not you. Get out of here. Sorry. Was there not a more corporate title in mind? Or was this to avoid confusion with DC Spider-Man? Gotta hate them Disney mandates. If you're planning to play this game in the future, consider this your... SPOILER WARNING! You know your story is onto something when it can juggle with so many different aspects and appropriately make you laugh, smile, certainly tear up, or I roll when it wants you to. For a character I once foolishly thought of as a has-been because of an avalanche of crappy stories, I sure was proven wrong by the three writing musketeers of John Paquette, Benjamin Arfman, Kelsey Beecham, and their co-writer Christos Cage. The narrative of the game shows off an understanding of subtle storytelling, uh, for the most part. Such as the introduction of Otto Octavius where he lurks in the shadow, acting as a great foreshadowing tool. Get it? Because he's actually in a shadow? Foreshadowing? Huh? <laughs> Fans of Spider-Man will pick up on this and so will the normies because just by the framing you can sense a disturbance in the force so to speak. And no better is the clever visual based storytelling brought to the test than in the opening. When I saw this thing I immediately knew all my worries and apprehensions specifically about the handling of the character were now a thing of the past. Right off the bat the first thing we see is the photograph of Aunt May and Uncle Ben. Glad to see Uncle Ben get embraced as an important figure in Peter's life. Not like that would be a hard thing to do or anything. Oh my god, this is it tells you all you need to know about Peter Parker. Come to think of it, Insomnia Games even managed to shove in some cheeky nods. They managed to get in a few references like a stack of classic comic books, namely Amazing Fantasy number 15, aka the debut issue of Spider-Man. And something that definitely does not resemble a PlayStation 4 Pro. Pizza time. In some areas, I'm willing to bet they're even drawing parallels to their own workplace, something many developers love to do. I mean, look at this place. It has all these coffee cups, computers, equipment, blueprints, sketch drawings, sketches of how these mechanics work. You even have the first frame of the video game, like some kind of concept art. What a way to start things off. In the first 60 seconds, we've gotten a more faithful version of the character than in any other show, movie, game, possibly even a comic in the past dozen of years. Hold up. In the past 11 years. All of that while laying out the foundation of who this guy is. Another thing the opening does well, right at the beginning Peter has to make a choice. Pay rent or help those in need. 
he makes his decision and later in the game gets a phone call from his landowner. Mr. Parker, this call serves as your third and final warning. Eviction proceedings. Wait, wait, I, I get paid at the end of the week. I can... Ugh. Eviction proceedings will start Friday unless full payment is received by closing business. Good day. Yeah, good day. These choices are held to a standard as seen later on in the game when Peter is kicked out of his apartment and your personal items are thrown out the trash. That puts you on a mission to scour garbage trucks to find a spider drive worth years of research. So basically you have Spider-Man's actions affecting Peter's life, which then end up affecting Spider-Man's portion of life back. Classic Spidey. I love when the writers don't forget about this stuff. It's things like these that ground the world in the most true to Spider-Man fashion. One that values the need for consequences. That's not to say there weren't any poorly written segments. There were. Do I care? Yes, which is why I'm going to run them down. But even these uneven attempts were mostly motivated by pure love for the source material. But really, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where do I begin? I guess a good place to start would be the second Mary Jane mission where she has to break into a Sable International outpost to talk to a guy named Standish, former demon hostage. Charles Standish? Holy crap! Charles, where is Dr. Morgan Michaels? Lee sent you, didn't he? The resemblance is uncanny. What's the problem with this scene, other than that it has one of the worst tropes in movie history? You know the one, a character is about to tell you something so, so important. They're going there to get... To get what, Charles? What do the demons need to get at Grand Central? <laughs> what the... Charles! Oh! Oh my what god, he's not a sable guy. Definitely not a sable guy. Back up over here. Okay, time Wait, to go. no, he knows something! <laughs> That was such a stupid plot point. Oh, I got knocked out. Uh. Oh, screw off game. I think what's funnier is there's a random gun just sitting there waiting for him, which he continues to aim at MJ, knowing very well she's someone to trust. She has Michaels in the Bowery. They're moving him to a new safe house tomorrow at noon. Stop She's pointing totally that gun! Grand Central. And when there's potential danger, he's still pointing it at her. So that the story can have an excuse for Peter to react all hostile. Charles! Oh! What the hell? He's not a Sable guy. Definitely not a Sable guy. Now, this part... This part is infuriating. Sable won't listen to me. But she's totally ignoring Grand Central. Grand Central? Sable knew about Grand Central and did nothing about it? That's like a police officer ignoring a bomb threat, except worse, because these soldiers were hired for the sole purpose of looking into every demon-related case. And Standish, let me remind you, is the CFO of Oscorp. This guy doesn't tell Norman about a potential terrorist attack that could endanger lives and the company he works for? Does he not care for Oscorp? Did he not read the PowerPoint presentation? Oh, it gets worse. Because that would also mean Norman never sat out Standish in the first place. You'd think the guy who hired a task force to obtain the demons would like to exchange a few words with his employee who was held captive by them. Or I guess Mary Jane is the only normal one to think straight. All it took was a single line of dialogue to make these characters out into outright morons. In its entirety, the scene is staged to the brim with artificial plot props. What are one-time disposable props, lines of dialogue, events, characters, or other elements of the story that move the narrative forward in exchange of unintentionally breaking the integrity of the writing. Like they had a creative idea of conveying key intel to MJ, but at the cost of exposing the inferiority of the script as it failed to take other things into consideration. Adding insult to injury, out of all the characters they chose, Spider-Man had to be the one to cause Standish to get knocked out. But what matters more, I guess, is he made himself look bad in front of MJ for the 30th time. Uh, look, he has relationship problems. Isn't he relatable? Hey, okay, another thing. Sorry, Charlie. You knock a man out. 
destroyed my background research, and the best you've got is sorry, Charlie. Is everything a joke to you? What? MJ, no, I screwed up. It was a tension breaker. Tension breaker? Right. Listen, I gotta go, Peter. Filing deadline. Peter. That's how you know she's still mad. Peter. Nice work, Mr. Superhero. That's your name. Also, nice hole on the roof. I'm sure Spidey appreciated the gesture. And then not even 10 seconds pass, he regains consciousness the moment they leave. Gee, they're not even trying to hide the low effort. That's just one scene, among many. Then there's the random case of Norman blaming Spider-Man for the prison outbreak, even though it was clearly Dr. Octopus. Great, pop on. Oh. What I mean, he wasn't affiliated with Spider-Man in any way, and it happened before Peter even got there. If anything, he helped contain the inmates from escaping. There are real reports, news footage, common knowledge, and witnesses to confirm all of this. Mayor Osborne has gone on record blaming Spider-Man for the prison break and citywide sickness, and branding him a fugitive. But he has yet Why? to provide evidence. And many believe the mayor is just deflecting blame. There's zero reason Norman would believe any of this. There's zero reason anyone would. Don't think about it too much, I guess. Oh. Even though an entire new enemy faction assigned to murder you on sight is founded on this nuisance. Happy to sign autographs, but no selfies. Characters in general blame everything on Peter all the time, and never is it played up as a malicious attempt at mischaracterization. They actually believe it. It's like they're all J. Jonah Jameson. That's crazy to me. And if you think Osborne only used Spider-Man as a cover-up, which, sure, that's a possibility, then he sure doesn't mind wasting a lot of resources and men on the wall crawler who he knows isn't even trying to kill him. And I can't think he's dumb enough to do that with all the evidence out there. The hard part was keeping you hidden from Sables. They branded you a priority target, you know. I humbly accept the honor. We just got a call from the hospital. They said you went AWOL. I need to get back to work. The doctor said you still have 14 broken bones. Which means I have 192 non-broken ones. You know, for all the consequences talk I gave earlier, they sure forget about them from time to time. I guess all it takes is one snappy line of dialogue to brush things off. And we're talking about Peter Parker here. The guy can't stop whining when he's out fighting with an ulcer. And the PowerPoint presentation. What can I say about this thing that already hasn't been said? Nothing. <laughs> with all this said, I don't want to neglect all the times we've gotten clever writing. There are times when the writers take everything at face value, treat things with respect, care, sincerity, and a level of cleverness. And then there are instances when we get as subtle as... Uh, comic book Spidey. How come I never fight guys with arachnophobia? Just in case you were worried. My webbing is never tested on animals. Just losers like you. How'd you get so violent? What is this video game? I praised these four before, and I mean every single word. I just need to know, what were you thinking with some of these decisions, goodness gracious. Did they not have a script doctor in the house? I think the problem narrows down to the overabundance of imprudent plot threads that fail to mesh with one another. I've seen the game do so much more, and to water down those examples by adhering to its ill-advised explanations calls for further attention in latter examples due to their relevance to the story. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to go there. So let's stay negative. Next up, this fella over here. The fact you spend a good amount of the game with him as the main villain, and I'm still confused with just about everything relating to the guy should tell you everything. It's common practice to get a better grasp on characters the more they show up. With Martin Lee, it wasn't like that at all. If anything, it was the stark opposite, as each encounter left me with more questions, especially in the places where they tried to explain him to you. The answers provided didn't clear anything up, and only raised new question marks. So let me get this straight. The deal with Martin Lee is there's a good side to him, but there's also a bad side called Mr. Negative, okay? The inconsistency being the guy is insanely evil even when he's his normal self. At the time you think his powers are mystical. Then you find out they're a result of an Oscorp scientific accident. 
which does not explain his manifested outer domain realm or the shrine in his office full of folklore references, insinuating there is a demon controlling him? The heck? He needed to pretend to be someone else to let his darkest feelings out? So is he evil because he's a crazy lunatic or because the powers make him out into a mean guy? It's never clear. His evil persona comes and goes, there's no rule to what's pushing him to transform full terrorist. What separates the man that's willing to murder innocents with a deadly virus and bombs just to get back at Norman from the man that's dedicated his life to helping the innocents with feast? Is everything okay? It's some personal business I've been planning for a while. Please take care of this place. It represents the best part of me. There are these letters where he thinks about turning back. Lee sounds conflicted. Almost like he didn't want to head down this path. But the demon is hungry, it says. And I don't think I can hold it back. Which tells us Martin Lee isn't the one seeking vengeance. It's the fake demon persona who is. My question is... Are you sure about that? If this was supposed to be a Jekyll Dr. Hyde counterpart, they failed to get that across as well. In fact, in his normal state, he's always looming around like some threat. Mr. Lee, did you find what you were looking for? Martin, you're back. I didn't get that. Thank you. And heading off again shortly, I'm afraid. You must have heard about City Hall. Yes. Tragic. Peter was there. He was very lucky. And an Osborne rally. I didn't know you were a fan. Is he Martin Lee in this scene or is he Mr. Negative? I, I just don't know anymore. I don't think you or May have anything to worry about. As long as you stay away from places you're not supposed to be. 12 seconds later. What matters is you are both safe. Amen. <laughs> Trying to kill Peter because he was at an Osborne rally. Really? Which one of you wrote this? Well, you could say that the demon is merely manifesting off of his negative emotions. But since it's been established that Martin Lee doesn't have those negative emotions, there's nothing to manifest off of. So there should be no Mr. Negative. The closest I could come up with was a comparison to the Green Goblin and his dual identities. In the comics best exemplified after he gets amnesia where there's a thin line separating the Goblin from breaking out of Norman. So you never know when he is his normal self and which second he will fully snap back into the insane crazy Norman. But even that's a stretch considering we're led to believe he's a good man deep inside. This isn't you! I won't abandon you in the darkness Martin! The Martin I know couldn't have done that. Whatever's become of him, that's not the one I want to remember. What a mess. Wait, wait, you can make an argument that Martin Lee is 100% responsible for all his actions. The folklore is just an aesthetic. The demon is merely a projection for all his evil doings. Um, yeah, no. That would insinuate he isn't a good person. There would be no actual inner battle, which definitely goes against what you're told in the later scenes. The writers were so preoccupied with setting up the mystery of his powers, they never came to a sensible consensus when it came to explain them. The other thing that's unclear is how he powers up. At first he sucks up by sucking the negativity out of others. At least that's what it would appear to be until the game then outright tells you he manifests them from his own anger and fears. Uh, so it's both? And so that too insinuates he is fully responsible for his actions. I sense conflicting information. The character is entirely pulverized by a broad area that falls all over the place. I'm sorry to say, this sentiment doesn't only apply to his powers, personality, and origin. The writing in general doesn't do him justice. The most I've seen him do is turn into a giant monster and spout generic dialogue. One way or the other, you will join me. Heal before me. This isn't you. I have honestly no idea what the writers were thinking with this one. Seeing now how his story arc was handled, I get the sense a good portion of the game story could have been salvaged from being so poorly constructed if it wasn't for trying to shove Mr. Negative. And they make him a member of the Sinister Six too. Mr. Negative trying to be relevant, but he ain't. Good 
I'm not entirely sure whose idea was to include him here. I don't think anyone was or will be screaming for his future appearance in anything. When I initially heard he was in the game, I thought to myself, cool. And then when I finally finished it, my reaction to him was a major, eh? Uh? I had a hunch he wasn't going to amount to much after the first gameplay trailer from E3 2017. I was hoping the generic catchphrases wouldn't be the writing on the wall that they ended up being. Why are you doing this? Because no one else will! There are so many more interesting villains with their own bad guy henchmen you could have brought forth. If the idea was to give him more exposure for popularity's sake, it's safe to say it didn't work out as well as you had hoped. The only thing the game exposed was how much of a broken character he is. I mean, who created this dumb character? Ah, uh, okay. Eventually, Dr. Octopus comes along and sums up his contribution to the story pretty well. Useless. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth, Aki. For real. I think Mr. Negative exists only to set important things into motion. I understand as storytellers, you should expect your character's decisions to affect the world around him. The problem is it's all Mr. Negative is ever used for. His evil schemes, his internal struggle, those things that are supposed to give his actions a level of importance are trash out the window. In Act 1, he is the supposed main villain. He's there to take advantage of Kingpin's leave. He causes tensions, starts a terrorist attack, he kills Miles' father, which works as a stepping on point for that character to come in. In Act 2, he too is the main villain. He gets his hands on the Devil's Breath and tries to unleash it at the train terminal. I don't want to get sidetracked, but I just want to point out how ridiculous it is Osborne had his technology out for public display, and one of them happens to disperse Devil's Breath into the air? Oscorp should be taking all preemptive measures to confiscate and secure any devices compatible with the disease. Especially if this guy can figure it out where it is, come on. And why is a perfectly functional device worth millions just sitting there out for grabs with no security in place? Phones in electronic stores are more secure than this thing. Did I mention it probably costs millions to produce? What is this writing? Anyway, Spider-Man comes in, the two toggle, negative spouts some more generic lines of dialogue. Twelve seconds later. Sure, Jan. Spidey saves the day and puts Lee behind bars. There are precisely two acts dedicated to this guy. He's the big bad. Suddenly Act 3 comes into play. Lee is now relegated to a supporting villain and it's Dr. Octopus that unleashes Devil's Breath by breaking the bottle. Hold up. What was this thing for? Uh, don't think about it. You were building up two acts to this moment and you don't even have Mr. Negative be the one to do it. Not to mention Spider-Man's entire long errand was about stopping this thing from spreading. You put up with so much rubbish, there was so much build up around this thing. To see it rush into another's villain's hands and have all that work go undone just like that? And the way they show all of this happen too is so brief. Man, this further highlights the writing issues I had. Back to Lee. He's basically relegated to a flashy beat em up boss. At least it puts into perspective the real conflict the people behind the game wanted to explore. The one of Peter and Otto, of course. To sum it up, Martin Lee is an immaterial and vague character. Narratively, he's as significant as a flat tire. It can only get you so far before you'll have to change it for a one that works. He's like the first bad guy in opening scenes of movies that the hero easily defeats, only with an over-glorified extended appearance and enough things connecting to him to create an illusion of relevancy yes. when in truth no one cares about Mr. Negative. Not even the characters. When it comes to Spider-Man games, everyone knows the thing to always make or break them is the swinging mechanic. If it ain't good enough, pack your bags and go home. Insomniac nailed it. They made the thing fluid and intuitive to a point where you barely want to fast travel. I can't tell you how many open world games are too big for their own good, 
Although a lot of detail and attention has been put into the looks and designs of these worlds, you won't find a reason to come back to most of their locations. Whereas in Marvel Spider-Man you will eventually veer by the same old buildings for hours end and likely won't urge to skip around. Traversal is a big component as to why that is. Coming up with an interesting alternative to walking will go a long way. It can be a fast car that chicks dig, awesome superpowers, a trusted horse, the more creative you are with it the better. However, a unique idea won't mean a thing if the system is unreliable or one-dimensional. The swinging mechanics in Spider-Man PS4 deliver on the spontaneous, fun, and dynamic. This is the type of game where you can literally hit a wall and say, I dig it. As you smoothly transition back into action, unless we're talking about the drone challenges. Insomniac sells you on the idea of freedom by implementing a defined and versatile traversal system. There's a lot of options you can take from. You can alternate between the much more direct regular web swing or the web zip and zip to point for quicker and more precise purposes. You can pull your swing with R2 until the end, cut it short by letting go of it or by pressing X for a boost. Through the use of the skill tree you will be able to add many more options that sync up with the ones already mentioned, the most useful one being the point launch boost. There's nothing more satisfying than the consecutive series of these. The devs thought of so many things. The hardcore parkour is an awesome new addition to the web slinger games that I would like to see expanded on in future installments. Hi, is this the flight to Newark? I do think it's a fair criticism to say the swinging animations can get played out. Not much of a big deal for me, but I understand where people are coming from. At least you can remedy some of that by unlocking cool tricks in the air. Peter Parker isn't a murderer, but for someone who isn't supposed to kill, he sure likes to... Shaka! Push it. Write her down. Can't afford to stick around. Cops will be here any second. Now I understand it's almost impossible to create a combat heavy game without over the top cool tricks. It's kind of like the super moves in Injustice, so not a major negative, but it does take you out of the game nevertheless. I'm not sure how the developers can get around it. Somewhere out there, there has to be a clever solution. Damien. They figure it out when it comes to kicking enemies off tall buildings. Definitely bringing in bad guys with powers who are more invulnerable makes these stunts more acceptable. The same can be said about the street thugs, whose spines likely retired long ago. Everyone just quietly go I don't think it's impossible to sacrifice spectacle over consistency while maintaining the excitement of things. It's not that big of a deal, but worth bringing up as the point still stands. Eliminating this qualm would greatly maintain the immersion we all want out of games, right? Right. They say that falling in love is wonderful. It's wonderful. Look, I don't hate Mary Jane Watson, but she has to be one of the worst additions to the game as a whole. For whatever reason, they decided to make her a journalist, borrowing a bit from Superman's gal. But where Lois Lane is focused, strong-willed, mannered, charismatic, confident, curious, 
From time to time you get to see her in another light where she's more vulnerable and nervous. MJ is just in your face and refuses to screw off. All because she's written into this weird modern trend of a woman that has to show signs of brash independence in order to be considered strong and any sort of reliance on a man will somehow make her lesser than one. They even give her her own missions that no one asked for. Literally no one. Not a single soul. It doesn't help these sequences are some of the most outright ridiculous ones in the game. At first it's not bad. She gets into a tough situation and with some luck and quick thinking, she uses the opportunity to her advantage. But then the game completely jumps the shark when she rips off her mask and underneath unveils her true identity. Solid Snake. Mary Jane Watson? Super spy. She outsmarts and outmaneuvers people who are more qualified than her in every field. What adds more to the offense is the use of the sound discs Peter gives her to make these missions more believable. Did it though? I think it just made them worse. Like are these guards blind? Do they not see what direction the flying discs are coming from? On my first attempt I was trying to throw them as far away from the sable agents as possible. Oh. It was obvious they'd see but the game actually forces you to toss the discs in front of their faces because they're not standing close enough. What? What the fuck? The game actually encourages you to be as obvious of your presence as possible. Well, I was giving the game too much credit. And also, is no one going to run a sweep after hearing the ambient? Isn't anyone going to call them in once they're investigated? This isn't Metal Gear. What are you trying to do here? All of this just totally clashes with the rest of the game. How incompetent do you have to make the enemies just to make your character look better than she is? Stay ready. I've almost got the location. Sweep complete. Sector clear. From this point on, it gets worse with each mission. There is, however, one sequence where you get to play as Mary Jane that I like, and that's at the central station. Watching Spider-Man on Hero Duty from a civilian's point of view is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. You never get to see Spidey from this perspective. It's a really nice attention to detail for all the bad these MG missions are. At least they gave us uh, uh I saw that game. Clearly designing these wasn't your number one priority and it shows. Hey. But at least it's representative of the portrayal of MJ as a whole. The writers doing everything in their power to prop her up while making everyone else less capable and inept. If there only was a way to name these type of characters. I bypassed the compressor. And if that's as far as the problem went, she wouldn't be that bad of a character. Alas, there's her relationship with Peter Parker. What's her deal? She wants to be his equal? constantly trying to prove her worth. You could say that's admirable, but for Mary Jane, I never cared for that aspect. And definitely not in the way it's presented here. She was never a literal equal to Peter. Dude, he's got spider powers. What do you have? Noisy discs? Stop! You serious? You guys can't be the same sort of equal. She can't fight her way out of situations. Her abilities as a fighter are very limited, and whenever the game tries to prove you otherwise, Is it's it only that much you? more embarrassing. You're lucky to be alive. This is the guy I saved five minutes ago. The amount of things she gets away with because of sheer luck and skills is ridiculous. Throw in as many one in a million maneuvers into the mix because I'm not buying it. If you think you're all that, Miss Watson, why don't you go fight bad guys? Let's see you get beat up and trampled after five seconds. The ability to claim oneself as independent does not make you formidable. I mean, what's Spider-Man doing in this game if she can do all the things he can? Break into Osborne's properties? No problemo. Infiltrate a Sable outpost? Moving him. Have to find out where before we lose our shot. Please, she takes care of those for breakfast. Get into Tombstone's office? Oh look, the door, how convenient for her. Come out of nowhere and seek the day? Yes. Did she have any plan? I ask this once again. If she's so amazing, why is Spider-Man here? The writers are constantly enamored with the idea that Peter needs her help. That she needs him as Spider-Man and that he needs a team to help them out. Hold up, where did I see this before? You are not the Flash, Barry. We are. No sane person can look at what she's doing and take that seriously. 
especially when you have to go to such lengths to rest your case, often at the cost of the webhead. MJ, if it weren't for you and Miles. Look at him, he can shoot bursts of webs left and right. The man is quick on his feet, reacting, stopping things from breaking apart. The sky could be falling and you can rely on this guy. But when it comes to making her look better, he suddenly loses control. Oh, he struggles to think fast, he's slow, he's too weak to hold up a platform. He's starting to swoon, he misses. Can you make up your mind? Does he have a your experience or not? Why must we make a character inconsistent to prop up another one? I have so many issues with the burning house apartment scene as is. Here, allow me to fix that for you. Better. I mean, this entire scene is just stupid. Manipulative is the best I can describe no. it. Oh no, he's gonna die. Why does Miles leap in out of nowhere like he knows Spidey is going to shoot a weapon Miz? Why is Spider-Man the only one weakened by the smoke while everyone else seems to be getting powered by it? The worst part about this whole affair is it could have been an awesome scene. Showing that Spider-Man 2 needs help, and having Miles and MJ help him out, and save him even? That's not a bad idea. Only not when it's rushed and slept together so evidently. But who cares, right? Because MJ comes to the rescue. This is not the Mary Jane I want to see. In the comics, she was always Peter's emotional crux, and even the movies, she was always what kept him going and truly made him complete in that way. That's the MJ I want to see. Those examples made her an equal to Peter in my eyes, only that's not the type of equal they want you to see here. And no wonder you end up with such a shallow character. I mean, let's see what she is without the tactical espionage action. Let's strip her down to... <laughs> let's strip her down to what she really is. At first, she seems pretty nice, outgoing, supportive, and even innocent. She's even interested in what he's currently doing, but still, nothing a regular friend wouldn't ask. And then it's all snark, jabs, negativity, arrogance, and degrading. We broke up because you wouldn't stop treating me like a baby. Don't do this, MJ. Don't do that, MJ. Blah 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 blah. I may not have super spider powers, but I'm not made out of glass. There's no chemistry, no history to work off of, not a lot of reasons for us to sympathize with her or the mean-spirited demeanor. Can Peter be a little worrisome? Yes. But why is she acting as if he obsesses over every little thing? She goes to dangerous places, meets dangerous people, her life is at a constant risk. I think it's fair to worry especially when you're just a human in very loud heels. The writers are obviously to blame as they expect the viewer to care about this relationship because it's Peter and MJ. You know they'll end up together so who cares right? They can do just whatever and they can still expect you to be invested. But are we ever given a real reason as to why we should care about the two other than we know they're a couple in the comics? No, no we are not. Which is why we needed more time with the pair talking about how much they care for each other. Just something so that we know the sentiment is mutual. Only thing Mary Jane is interested in is becoming work partners to do her reporter job better. So, are we partners now? Partner. Partner. Partners. I think partners trust each other, Peter. There's a chance we have to stop them. We. See ya, partner. It's pretty clear she's not interested in going back to their dating days at all. She's not interested, man. If anything, she seems to have a strange distaste when it comes to developing the relationship further. Do you remember why we broke up? Peter, on the other hand, he's trying. He may be at fault sometimes, but there's no denying he tries to atone for his shortcomings. When Parker screws up, we know he regrets it. Well, you know, she's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. No, it isn't. She's a... As for MJ, whenever it comes to completing her end of the bargain, she always finds a way to make it about her personal space and how she wants Peter to accustom himself to her needs. She's like a praying mantis, and it doesn't help she sometimes looks like one. It's weird how they tend to fail to do these actors justice in video games. The two supposedly had a relationship prior to this one, sure. I would have liked to known what that was like other than we... We broke up because of you. I break up with you. Yeah, doesn't help. 
it's a bit of a shame the story doesn't give us anything to make the romance believable. There were so many opportunities to develop the relationship, like when Pete comes over to her house to cook and talk about the demons. I imagined an interesting conversation back and forth, a moment between the two perhaps about their past, a chance to talk heart to heart, get more personal. So when we finally get the scene, I can help but get annoyed by the fact the most we get out of it is the Great Dumpling Catastrophe. You're never gonna let me live that one down, are you? Nope. The Great Dumpling Catastrophe. I still can't believe they evacuated the entire building. I know, and in January too. <laughs> Your neighbors hated me. Yeah, they were pretty happy when we broke up. <laughs> yeah. So. Psych! Let's talk about what you found in Lee's office. Dumpling talk, so quirky yet so insignificant. I guess relatable too? Definitely a wasted opportunity. And then she makes a big ordeal out of Peter leaving his clothes on the kitchen floor as though it matters. Your clothes on the kitchen floor? Honey, where are my pants? Ha ha ha, so funny. Why is this still going? Why does it matter that his clothes are on the kitchen floor? Why? This isn't a great development for their relationship. Snorking about clothes on the kitchen floor? Really? What is she gonna complain about next, leaving the toilet seat up? They talk about becoming partners in their lines of work, but that's no different from any of their other interactions. You know, I hear some people say, oh, I like how relatable and down-to-earth their relationship is in the game, without realizing that this is the very problem. How is their relationship any different from your work partners or your friends? This is MJ and Peter we're talking about here. They are supposed to be the couple, the ones to have to hold from a day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, until death do them apart. They're supposed to be soulmates. This relationship can't be just casual. Get away from me with this. Oh, I like how they have normal couple problems. I can definitely relate to that. I don't expect to see them dying in each other's arms like Romeo and Juliet either. I just want more than talking about how bad of a cook Peter is. That doesn't cut it. Sorry. Not especially when it gets undercut with a robbery and an overdrawn bit about pants on the floor. It's embarrassing how scared they are of developing a real romantic relationship. Why bother if you have history of movies and comics doing the heavy lifting for you, right? Mary Jane Watson never shows affection for the men until the end of the game for no reason other than they're MJ and Peter, and you know, you're not supposed to question it. I never stopped wanting to. Wait a minute! Who are you? And there's the forced kiss. Okay, that's enough of that. Even Mary Jane's iconic line is forced in and doesn't sound right coming out of her mouth. Almost as if she's another character. Almost as if sharing the same name as your comic book counterpart does not make you one. Go get him, Tiger. My name is Jeff. Remember boys, to get a girl all it takes is finding a way to make her mad at you. I was more often led to believe Mary Jane is a self-centered egotist. No. No, I got myself into this. I'm getting myself out. What do you mean you got yourself into this? After Peter's fight with Mr. Negative at the central station, the two are separated. Mere seconds after the event, he tries to contact her. What does MJ do? She assumes he was trying to talk to her about their relationship and interprets the text. It's over as news that he is done with her. No, 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 not that kind of over. Scratch that. I do hate this character. Someone should throw her off a bridge just so we can snap her back to reality and help her notice how careless of a person she is. You think after a deadly face-off, a near high casualty event, where she along with many other hostages leave in the middle of the chaos, that her mind would be set on whether Peter is okay, you know, if he got hurt or anything of that sort. But no, it's always about her. Look guys, remember when you also texted a girl and she misinterpreted what you wrote? Congrats writers, you've succeeded at making her out into a narcissist. Why does she always have to make it about herself? I want to like this character. I really do. Every time I think there's still hope for her, it evaporates with the rest of her personality. Please say no, please say no. And then I still cling on to hope. <laughs> okay, okay. And then she gives you another reason to hate her. You could have told Peter or the police earlier, you endangered all these people because of your sheer insecurity and pride. 
Should probably call Peter and let him know what I'm doing. Actually, scratch that. He'd probably just tell me to go home and chain myself to my laptop. That could be an interesting development for her, but the character is too self-unaware of how wrong she is, and the writing never plays to confront this in any real way. But hey, at least she's good for female empowerment. I think the writers could have made the romance work had they not made it so much about MJ's ego and career. When you get to the climax of the MJ subplot, you realize how much it has to do with those things than any other ones, really. I'm sorry I screwed things up. It's just hard being the one who always gets saved. Hard being the one who always gets saved. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. You know, sometimes I want to do the saving. I'm sorry I made you feel like you couldn't. Why are you apologizing? Still partners. Always. Thankfully, my man Miles saves us from more cringe. Maybe the reason why she's impulsive shouldn't be because she's sick of being the damsel in distress. Rather, that she too worries, and it's not fair, Peter thinks he's the only one who's in the position that can. We've seen him put the good of others over his own multiple times. It would be a fair criticism to have. It's not fair that you're supposed to engage in a relationship with someone that can't even ensure you that they'll come back. Imagine if this was her driving motivation and not whatever this is. Perhaps it could have made her character and their romance work better. You'd finally get an idea that, yeah, she's mad because she cares. She actually cares. Doesn't even mean you have to sacrifice the self-reliant and snazzy reporter personality. The reasoning could only add to the hero partner storyline. Think about it, maybe she wants to team up with him so that maybe she can have more of a decision on his actions while they're both out there. So that maybe she can be there when he makes the decisions about putting his life at risk. But I guess it's not empowering enough, right? Hey, at least I tried making the kiss more digestible. Blech. During the E3 2017 demo, Miles Morales was announced to appear in the game. I was worried. It seems like every other day you cannot enjoy a Spider-Man story without Miles Morales being shoved in your face. The comic book iteration pushed the character into the main universe, undoing a lot of his stories. They forced him into a Teen Titans discount team. Now he's guest starring in a cartoon. Look, now he's one of the recurring characters in another one. Now let's set him up in the MCU just in case we want to bring him in later. We had the 2018 animated film, which wasn't that bad all things considered. With Miles what always put him in a bad light for me was the tendency to sell him off as the guy who will eventually take up the Spider-Man mantle, that he was somehow an equal to the OG, insinuating there could be a future in Spider-Man without Peter Parker. No thank you. <laughs> Marvel Comics was trying to sort of go in this direction recently when Pete was in his billionaire Mr. Mr. Worldwide, Worldwide phase. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> so you can imagine what I thought when I saw him included in the E3 trailer. The fact that they were introducing a new Spider-Man in the first game of a series only strengthened my apprehensions. Turns out he was one of the best written characters in the game. For one, this Miles was never from another universe. They also made many changes in his character, namely he loses an important father figure like Peter, and he's an exceptionally super smart geek like Peter. Gotcha, I'm the same way. Make of that what you will. Within the context of the game, it works well and creates a great catalyst for better development. Miles' father is also a cool character. His death brought Miles naturally into the fold, Dad. unlike what they did Dad. in the comics for whatever reason. Dad, no. By the way, the explanation behind why he was brought over to the main universe in the comic books was because he had a sandwich in his pocket. I am not kidding. Just shove him in, boys! Foremost, the kid is brutally honest. He's not always painted as a nice guy. I don't blame him for giving Peter the cold shoulder, especially when he doesn't know the guy really. You have a reason as to why he's acting out. And it's not artificial. Plus, he apologizes for it when he finds out about Peter's experience with dead parents. He didn't have to. Sorry, that you had the oh, funeral. Totally oh, good, Miles. His hey, dynamic with talk. the other protagonists is actually relevant. He has a supportive mother, and Peter, MJ, May, they all help him tread the murky waters. 
it's not tacked on and it's given it time to play out. He's not this super flawless, confident, diversity character you see so much of today. He's actually a real, fully developed character. What's more is his stealth missions are actually good. The developers prevent themselves from repeating the same mistake twice by not turning him into a spec ops spy only second to MJ. Instead, they take from what they've established about the character. They take his super geek trade and put it to good use. In place of these stupid sonic discs, he can hack into objects and utilize them as a form of distraction. Who knew the key to good character writing is building on top of what you already have? Who would have thought? There's one Rhino scene where the scale is set big and still. It's more believable than anything you see MJ do. Not to mention it's well directed and fun to play. One thing I would take out from both of their levels is the spider sense effect. It shouldn't be controversial to say Spider-Man should be the only one to have it. He may not play the most essential bro, but he does add a lot of dynamic to the team and he never takes away from anyone else. Not to mention some of the funniest scenes will include him in some way or form. You have his number. Are you Spider-Man's girlfriend? That'd be so cool. <laughs> so far he's learned to take matters into his own hands. He isn't anywhere close to becoming a hero. So thankfully there's not much I need to say about that. But I do worry in where it appears, even in small doses. You know, there's this one scene that's kind of corny and cheesy and kind of sticks out from the rest of what we see in the game. A bit too on the nose, a little too corny. Alright, put him up. Seriously? Yeah, come on. First thing. Don't let the adrenaline get to you. Breathe slow, breathe deep, relax. Just where you're going. Let them make a person. The bite, or at least the discovery of his power, should have definitely happened in the proper sequel. The expansion could have waited, no one expected it to come so soon until it got announced anyway. We don't need Spider Miles this early. You got 50 years of Spider Man history prior to this character's creation. Why is everyone suddenly so inclined to shove him into everything? The idea of having two Spider Men running around in the same universe so soon, this is not gonna go the way you think. Anyway, I hope Insomniac doesn't forget what worked about Miles Morales in the first place. And kudos to them for making the character compelling. There is so much more potential for Miles in the foreseeable future installments. Take notes, MJ, because this guy outdid you in every department. Gameplay, character development, and interactions with others. The writing is at its best here and I think it's because there isn't as much character history to fall back on as an excuse. And of course, it helps he's charismatic too. You're the amazing Spider-Man. You're the spectacular Spider-Man. And a few other choice adjectives Jameson uses. I need a hero! I'm holding up for a hero till the morning In all honesty, I almost couldn't put the game down. When you think of classic examples of game design, you usually don't think open world, yet here we are. A lot of it has to do with what I already touched on when I was talking about the traversal and how it's a key component to why I was hooked. The second and the paramount factor that plays into it would be the meticulous world design. Specifically how well it innovates to replicate that classic scenario of a superhero saving citizens in peril. This means the map is filled with missions on top of missions that thrust you into the position of answering abrupt calls of duty. Oh what, it's not fun getting beat up? Well sit with that for a while. You were just in time. They were like animals. So was I. One of such mission types is a crime, which will appear at any time like when you're minding your own business on the way to the main objective. There it is, your hero moment. If you wait too long, the alert will disappear so the bad guys get away. There are no consequences for not making it on time or choosing to ignore it. Regardless, it puts you on the spot as though it is actually your time to answer a hero's call. And I love that. I don't think I've ever intentionally ignored a crime because of how well they were placed within the city. And the thing about this whole thing is even if you're preoccupied with a crime, which includes saving a life, fighting off crooks in the alley, taking pursuit in a car chase, dealing with a kidnapping, Easy, I've got you. you aren't sacrificing your engagement in the story just because you're momentarily setting it aside and that to me is a big deal. 
helping your fellow citizens takes up to a minute or two. These are nothing for him. Your friendly neighborhood personified. And just like that you can directly go back to your story based mission. The narrative won't get distilled by any of this. What helps maintain this feat is no crime report will start you off on a separate story arc that would take away the spotlight from the campaign. And that to me is brilliant. Most open world games predominantly have self-contained side quests deriving its players from the main storyline. Yes, I would love to help you find your goat. Could you ask me some other time though? I'm about to head to a guy who wants to kill my friends, loved ones and will bring down the apocalypse upon this world if we don't hurry. Okay. Which isn't to say there are no side missions with diegesis of their own. There's simply fewer of them and they're easily identifiable on the map. In most cases, you know what you're getting yourself into before going in. There's no mission that will start you off looking for a and end you off slaughtering a werewolf. And I say this as someone who likes those type of scenarios. Getting thrown into the deep waters before you know it can be awesome. What I'm trying to get across is... Too many of them in a row will take you out of the flow of the main story and Spider-Man PS4 finds a way around that. There are many other objectives smartly placed on your way to the intended destination, yet none fighting for your attention. Throughout the sandbox you will run into landmarks, plenty for you to take pictures of. What the game doesn't tell you is there are also secret landmarks, hidden throughout which make for notable surprises. Oh my gosh! Get out of the frame. Great! Forgot how much I love photography. I can only imagine what other secrets I missed. There's always something to spot, and there's always time to stop and take in your surroundings. Whether it be famous monuments, iconic structures, up to date newspaper, fictional and real. And let's not forget about the fan favorite backpacks. Hey, my Mark 1 web shooters. Managed to improve the storage capacity a lot since then. These wonderful little things were left on the rooftops by Peter Parker over his 8 year tenure as Spider Man. With each find, he goes off on a little heartwarming, jocular, and endearing, insightful anecdote, bringing you up to speed on additional character moments while giving you a better, truer understanding of the guy. Much better than chasing feathers or mysterious puzzle pieces that together form a meaningless video clip. Yeah. That blind guy gave me his card in case Spider-Man ever needs a lawyer. Wait, hold on. If he's blind, how did he know I was Spider-Man? The only problem I had was there wasn't enough of them. People who aren't all that into side quests probably found the time to look for these. That should say a lot. Did I mention there are pigeon chasing missions? Unfortunately, due to the graphic nature of the material, we are not allowed to air the footage. Except the pigeon lady from Home Alone 2 instead. The Black Cat stakeouts are probably the only type I had a major issue with. They're extremely easy and there's not much you get out of completing them. At times it seems like they're only there to promote an expansion or so. Okay, here's the problem. The excitement around the city that never sleeps died out fast. They came and went. Why not scrap the expansion idea and instead condense it into smaller scale tombstone like extended side missions? I have certain ideas on what portions you could have removed to make room for Black Cat. <clears throat> As for the stakeouts, were they necessary? And I don't see a need for blatant teases that are as subtle as DLC character announcements at the end of pre-release fighting game trailers. These are as useful as ads in front of free mobile games. It's like they're proud of withholding content by making you actually play the commercial. At least EA makes it easy to spot the greed. You don't even get to meet her. Give us complete games, don't break them into chunks and stretch- A new suit? If you've got it, flaunt it. Oh, sick. This couldn't all have just been a game. What's this? Wow! So cool. Wait, what were we talking about again? The gameplay is just pure fun. I'm enjoying the things on the side more than a lot of what's in the story. One second I'll be chasing pigeons, another saving the environment, talking to homeless people, high-fiving the civilians. Losing myself in the meticulously designed world is all one could want out of a video game. None of the missions are like the lambasted filler only there to keep you preoccupied with a bunch of garbage fish quests. The amount of awesome things to do and find on top of the awesome web swinging makes this out into an unforgettable map that you want to spend as much time in. 
Not easy to comp by when most open worlds give you long empty planes that may be astounding to zoom past the first time. The initial effect often won't be enough to warn you to come back. Whereas Spider-Man PS4 will have you swinging past the same buildings several times and you won't even think about it because you're always doing or noticing something new, deepening your appreciation of the world and characters. The last ball game Uncle Ben ever took me to. I need to get this framed. I could really use his advice now. Oh yeah. It's all coming together. Since we're on the topic of the world, it's only fair to mention the likes of the system that encourages you to pursue all the mentioned objectives. The different mission types are clearly spread out throughout the game depending on what point in the narrative you find yourself in. And I find this hand-in-hand -hand approach to story and gameplay extremely effective in terms of keeping the familiar world ever so changing. Hence why by Act 3, the environment you've become pretty familiar with will become extremely hostile occupied by military out to kill you, empty streets overrun by criminals, new deadly foes, and challenges to face. Having reference of how things looked before makes watching things go to pot that much more exciting, especially when it changes how you move about in your surroundings. It's important to note this is also the part of the game where you're bombarded with punchy punchy missions and not much of anything else. They did go a bit overboard, didn't they? Then there's the system itself that binds the various missions to the playstyle. With each task you tend to, you'll gain more skill points. With each skill point, you can gain more abilities from the skill tree that can make demanding secondary objectives easier to complete. The better you perform at those, the more tokens you get. There are exactly 6 types of tokens, just like there are 6 types of objectives, namely the mentioned crimes, backpacks, and landmarks, easier for casual players to achieve, and the soon to be mentioned research stations, enemy bases, and <sighs> challenges. For ideal optimization, it's best to go for all of them, even if some cause you to hurt mentally. They unlock better gear, mods, and powers that can lift the burden off of you in a lot of these scenarios. As you can see, it's a circle of life. It's all connected. It's such an intuitive system, it just works. It just works. Benchmarks suck. For those who don't know, benchmarks is a checklist of the different things you can do in the game. Take sticking enemies to walls, for example. If you stick 100 of them, you'll complete a benchmark. Physically throw 100 enemies. Okay. One third of it, at least. There are precisely three levels to almost each skill. In this continual case, the second level raises the bar up to 250 enemies. Level 3 makes you do it to 500 of them on top of that. Some of them aren't so bad, as you complete them without thinking much about it while minding your own business in the game, like wall running, parkour, diving. When it gets bad is when you're faced with combat related marks, the likes of disarming 100, 250, and then 500 enemies to complete all levels. Isn't this fun? Oh boy, oh boy. Even now, I'm still wondering what the point was. If it was to change up my playstyle, I'd have to disagree. Developers should be encouraging me to diversify my movesets by providing me with a diverse batch of enemy types. This argument continues to fall apart when you consider there are already things in the game that get you to approach things differently. They're called mission objectives. I haven't seen this city this bad since, well... Since never. And if you think this is changing up my fighting style, then I have no idea what games you're playing. At least they'll probably reward you with something cool once you complete all of them. Surely the grind mustn't have been for nothing. No! WRONG! Okay, you get two trophies. One for completing one of the combat benchmarks on level 1, and the same for a traversal benchmark. The two easiest things you're bound to complete without even realizing. But you don't know this. At least not until you're sifting through the uncovered trophy list. Thankfully, I didn't do all of them. And that's only because I went to check online whether they were actually unnecessary after I received my platinum earlier than expected. The damage was still done. I'll never forget the restless hours throwing and pushing people to their deaths. Uh, unconsciousness, I mean. Yet still, I looked around and realized there were individuals who completed all of these without knowing they'd be useless. 
Just know if you're out there, my heart goes out to you. I'm sorry for your loss. Look, I know you don't know me. I just wanted to say, I know what you're going through. It all gets easier with time. What they should do is get rid of benchmarks, period. For this sequel at least, try lowering the requirements. The only thing you get out of completing all the benchmarks is a shot of dopamine from all the checkboxes. We're now resorting to social media strategies to design games. How innovative. Doing the grocery list is more rewarding than this. At least I'm checking off stuff I'm actually going to use. The Black Cat Stakeouts had the audacity to reward you with a new suit. I don't think I've ever seen a more tedious element in a good game. On top of everything, the grinding for the sake of grinding unveils how stupid the AI is. And so my friends, it would seem Marvel Spider-Man doesn't have the perfect story after all. On more than one occasion, the writing is filled with plot holes and contrivances which go on to dampen the overall experience. And still, we're greeted with one of the best depictions of Peter Parker in the modern era. This is enough for me to recommend this to anybody, yet there is much more to discuss. From the combat to the Taskmaster challenges, or the entire third act in Doc Ock. And as you can imagine, these videos take quite a while to script, edit, and put out, so if you're interested in seeing part 2, I would appreciate every like, subscription, and comment you leave behind. I have much more planned for the foreseeable future. Any support, even as simple as sharing the video around to your friends, would mean a whole lot. Farewell, Spider-Man fans, and thank you for listening.